Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're from. Very happy to be here and to see so many people join our online demo day, focusing on disruptive technologies in the supply chain. Also very excited to see so many of our partners online from around the globe too, so thank you for coming. But for those who don't know me in SOSA, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to introduce myself and what we do. So I'm Dafna Moroz, I'm the VP Innovation here at SOSA. SOSA is an open innovation company. Uh, we work with multinational corporations and governments to develop and execute innovation strategies. These strategies lead to identifying, partnering, implementing, and investing in the right technologies. Many of our partners are linked or dependent on supply chains in one way or another. And as we all know, global supply chains have been disrupted in a way that the world has not witnessed before the COVID-19 crisis. What was even more striking was that many companies were not ready for this crisis in any way. Almost instantly, the focus of supply chain management has become crisis management. This has become a major catalyst for digitization and automation, or in other words, innovation. During the last few months, we've seen an increase in implementation of technologies, roughly, I'd say, in three main areas. We've seen a substantial adoption of robotics and autonomous operations for warehouses and distribution centers and for order and inventory fulfillment. This has been critical for the lights out scenario and happened, that happened during the COVID-19 crisis. Also for operational efficiency and of course, worker safety. We've also seen advanced uh, analytics, IoT and AI in supply chain operations. This has always been key, but however, the crisis has definitely put a spotlight on the need for these technologies to opt optimize supply chains. The ability to analyze massive quantities of historical data and collect real-time data will be crucial, crucial to efficiently optimize decision-making and mainly and most importantly, reduce costs and errors. Last but not least, COVID-19 has put a strain on last mile delivery. Many retailers and consumer businesses had to start home deliveries basically overnight. This, together with the shift in consumer behavior, people pushing back on long at times, needs for contactless deliveries and so on, has definitely brought technology front and center in the past few months and will play a huge role in the future of last mile delivery. The companies that will be presenting today are leading in their sector and definitely stepped up their game during the COVID-19 crisis. Just one reminder before we start, we'll be taking questions from the audience, so please feel free to write down the questions in the Q&A below. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to start and I would like to welcome the first company. Uh, we have Tzvi Schreiber, CEO of Freitas with us. Freitas provides an end-to-end -end digital freight pl platform for real-time pricing and booking. Welcome, Tzvi. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me on, Daphne. Good to see you. So, uh, the floor is yours, Tzvi. Okay, great. Uh, good. You can see me. You can see my screen. Yes, definitely. Okay, good. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Svi Schreiber. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Freitas. Um, so, let me give you just a, some quick background and then I'm going to show you uh, what, the, what the service looks like. Uh, first of all, we know this, so I'll go through it really quickly. I mean, global trade has, has ballooned in the last decades. It's now almost $20 trillion worth of goods uh, across borders every year. I guess this year it will be 20% less, but still massive amounts. And this has become a huge part of the world economy, huge part of the products that we buy. 90% of the products that we buy in the West are imported. So this is a huge part of our lifestyle and uh, it's related to billions of jobs as well. And uh, as many of you know, there's a massive shipping industry an air cargo industry uh, allowing international trade. Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on shipping, air cargo uh, and, and uh, you know, road and rail as well. Now, I discovered uh, what a old-fashioned industry this is. So um, I'm a software entrepreneur. I've had some uh, software exits before. But in 2010, 2011, I actually managed a hardware company for the only time in my life, a company called Litech. We made this little product here, which goes in the ceiling. It, it powers LED lights. And um, we produced them in Shenzhen, Shenzhen, China. And every day, we were shipping these things by ocean and by air from China, mainly to the U.S., and to Europe. And, you know, the first time I did this, I thought that, that an international shipment shipping a container would be like booking a flight. You know, for 20 years already, if you want to book a flight, it's easy. Well, not so much right now, but other than this year, you go on a website, you see all the options, you choose, you book. Um, really very, very simple, very, very transparent. But in this industry, I discovered, and then later at Pratos, we did a lot of research to confirm what I'm telling you 
there's often a 30% price spread, but sometimes as much as 100% two containers sitting next to each other would have a very different price. It can take two or three days. Still today, if you're not using freight offs, you put up a freight forwarder, a simple price quote will take an average of three days, believe it or not. When you get the invoice, it doesn't match the price quote anyway. Uh, and um, everything's managed in spreadsheets. And I discovered later at Freitas that the, the, the reason behind this is structural. So you've got the actual importers and exporters who are buying the service. Um, you've got about 100,000 freight forwarders in the world, 100,000, starting from the very big ones who do tens of billions, right down to the little ones. And in a given transaction between the forwarder and the actual carrier, the carrier here is the ship owner, the airline, the, the trucking company, that there's often one or two or three intermediaries. Um, and the problem being that a lot of the communication back and forth is, uh, is manual. So you, you end up with a very sort of last century kind of experience where the prices are, everything's slow, everything's manual, everything's opaque. So the vision of Freitas is to make global trade frictionless by, by giving the same digital freight experience in the same way that international travel has become frictionless, again, outside of the COVID crisis, you know, based on the, the fact that travel has become digital. So what, what I propose to do in the next uh, four minutes or so is to show you the product and then say just a, a few words about what's behind it. So let me see if I can switch to, okay. All right, good. So I'll just repeat this search so you can see it. So this is a public site. This is the Fredos site, uh, uh, fredos.com. And so you're welcome to try this for yourselves. And um, I'm, um, I'm here an importer, let's say an American importer, and I've got, maybe I've got two containers, which are 40 foot. And uh, I'm gonna get them from, let's say from China. This was a search I did before, I'm gonna change it now. So I need to get these containers from the port of Shanghai uh, pick up on Monday, and I need to get it all the way to my warehouse in San Francisco. And I need the customs clearance. Um, I don't need a customs bonds, and I need insurance. Okay, so, and my goods are worth, let's say, $25,000 would be sort of fairly typical, typical I guess. Um, so what you're seeing now is an experience. We've all had this in retail and passenger travel. We've had this kind of experience for, for 20 years almost. Um, but in our industry, this is a complete revolution. This is the only site um, really where you can instantly get price quotes. You can see I've already got 68 price quotes, 80 price quotes uh, for shipping uh, a few containers from the port of Shanghai to San Francisco. Um, and now as they come, I can see what's the best value, what's the cheapest, what's the quickest, what's the greenest in terms of carbon footprint. Um, I have here offers from very small freight forwarders like Freight Right, from big uh, multi billion dollar forwarders like Eculine. I've got a Chinese forwarders and American forwarders. I can see the reviews. Um, I can see the full uh, routing if I want. So I can see this is going from Shanghai to Oakland. Here's the price from Shanghai to Oakland uh, port, and then destination charges, and then the truck from Oakland to San Francisco. So we've automated all of the routing and all of the pricing. Uh, and I can go ahead and book online and pay online. I can pay now uh, or I can apply for credit. I think we've got some banks in the audience today. So a big part of what we have to do is not just uh, all of this freight pricing, but also collecting the money between the buyer and seller, often different currencies. The buyer often, often wants credit. Um, the seller, seller always wants to be paid yesterday. Um, so that's the experience. And then once I you know, once I do that, um, on, if I just go back to the presentation for a second, um, once I book in Freitas, of course, I manage the whole shipment, not in Excel, but in Freitas as well. So we give a whole experience uh, for shipping. So let me just tell you a little bit about our strategy um, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so we have, we, we really replicated the model of passenger travel, but there was a huge problem. So in passenger travel, when Expedia and Orbit and Priceline and Booking, when they launched, they did the consumer side, but all of the back end was already done. There were these companies, Faber and Amadeus, big companies who've been around for decades. And then uh, the routing was done by ITA. Um, and so all of the background was there. In freight, there's no such thing. So Freitas really, uh, we're quite a complicated startup. 
Uh, we, we've got Freitas.com, which you saw, but behind the scenes, we've got a software as a service and a, a digital platform to connect the carriers and the forwarders and do the routing and pricing. So we've got some really heavy technology behind that and a lot of data. We need to import. There are no data standards in this industry. We import every day hundreds of Excel sheets. In total, we've got billions of price points, most of which still come out of Excel sheets that we have to ingest. So a very heavy interest, just to give you a quick idea, whoops, um, just to give you a quick idea of the infrastructure, we have our two platforms, Freitas.com, which you saw, which um, connects the importers and exporters to the forwarders, and we have a subsidiary called WebCargo, which connects the forwarders to the carriers. We offer software as a service at every stage, and then also coming out of all of this, we have a data business, so we produce some indexes. Where we have, in partnership with the with this, uh, Baltic Exchange, which is part of the Singapore Exchange, we produce the leading index for prices uh, with plans to move that towards actual derivatives. So in, in future, you'll be able to hedge the price of a container shipping, just like you can hedge the price of uh, oil. Uh, just to give you a little bit idea of our customer base, so we work with thousands of importers and exporters, mostly smaller importers. We have a, um, a major partnership now with Alibaba. We are the shipping partner for their B2B site, alibaba.com. We work with 1,800 forwarders, including these, uh, these are just a few examples of the big multi-billion dollar freight forwarders who are using our technology. And we work with carriers, particularly strong on the airline side. Um, we are the, uh, the key sort of um, partner for a lot of airlines and their effort to sell cargo digitally, which is only just taking off. And of course, uh, a little bit tougher with COVID, but uh, in general, finally, the uh, air industry is going digital and we're major uh, partners for that. So um, so that was a little bit about um, Freitas, just to give you some idea, we're a company of about 200 people. We've raised $93 million. Uh, our main locations are in uh, Jerusalem, Ramallah and Barcelona, and then small offices also in India and China. Um, and um, yeah, we're really very serious about digitizing this massive complex old-fashioned industry and I think so far we're making some good progress so thank you thank you Tzvi that was really interesting thank you um, so we'll be taking uh, questions from the audience now and also you'll see us a, a poll on your screen so if you're interested in uh, connecting with Tzvi please let us know and uh, we'll definitely help you with that um, so just wait for a few questions um, Okay, so first question, what kind of changes in demand have you seen during the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, so I'd make a distinction maybe between ocean and air. Uh, demand has not, not been changed too much, except of course during uh, sort of February, March, because the, China was closed down and a lot of the imports are from China. So China was closed down for Chinese New Year and for two or three weeks afterwards. So during that month, there was very little shipping going on. As soon as China reopened, which it did within about a month, uh, shipping went back. I think in the, if you look in the industry, shipping uh, volumes are down about 20%, depending which route. Uh, but Freitas is growing anyway. So our, um, our number of shipments has continued to grow, actually, despite COVID. Uh, air is a different situation. The demand is, is not down, but the supply is, is way down. A lot of um, air cargo goes on passenger flights. Uh, some of it goes on freighter aircraft, that's continuing, so there are still freighter aircraft in the air. There's even some passenger aircraft being converted into freighters, they take out the seats and put, uh, but, but despite all of that, the capacity is down. I was just talking to a major airline yesterday, they said their cargo capacity is 20% as usual. Um, so air, not, not that demand is down, but the uh, supply is way down, um, starting to recover very slowly. Thank you. So we have another question. Um, actually, we actually talked about this a few days ago. I have a lot of insurance partners and banking, in, on, uh, banking partners online. So wondering if you can tell us a bit more how your solution is relevant to these industries and specifically like the insurance option that you showed on your platform. Yeah, so insurance, you know, whenever people buy freight services on our, on our website, we offer them uh, marine insurance or cargo insurance as well. Uh, at the moment, we have a partner who we're pleased with, but always open to uh, discussing with other partners. If you're in the business of marine insurance, I don't know if we're going to switch, but happy to have a, a conversation. Um, and then 
in terms of banking, I mean, a, a big part of what we, what we do is the financial operations. So every transaction we do, the money goes through us. And in many cases, it's, it's coming in and out in different countries and different currencies. And as I mentioned in my talk, in many cases, there's a need for credit. Uh, right now, we're, we're providing that credit off our own balance sheets, but as we grow, that, that obviously won't be feasible. Uh, it's a big pain area. I mean, um, when we do talk to banks, they don't really know how to do, in most cases, we've found they don't know how to do the factoring uh, internationally, um, and they don't know how to work with the marketplace because we're not the vendor, and that confuses them. So it's not, a tra it's not the classic case of sort of accounts receivable financing. Uh, and we've had, we've got stuck with a lot of conversations with banks. But if you're a bank who knows how to help a marketplace to do accounts receivable financing across countries and currencies, then uh, yeah, please give me a call. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have one more question, uh, time for one more question. So the question is, what in your perception is the main barrier for companies to switch from the old system to Fredos? Do you have to give up some value that exists in the old methods? So it depends what kind of company you are. I'll answer very briefly twice. Once, if you're an importer and exporter, uh, if you're a small importer and exporter, then it, it's a real pleasure to, you know, to move to Freitas. We get fantastic uh, feedback from small importers, Amazon sellers, that kind of thing. Uh, if you're a big importer, it's more complicated. You've got your ERP system, you've got your sort of your tenders. So they tend to use us more for spot, not for their regular shipments. Um, in terms of the providers, the big freight forwarders, the airlines, um, those are big projects. They're very successful and they've created a lot of value, but it, it takes the forwarder months, in some case up to two years to switch if they've got, if they're very big, to really switch onto Freitas and really automate their pricing. Okay, thank you very much, Zvi. It was really interesting. And uh, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll make sure to facilitate the questions. So thank you very much, Sri. Thanks. Bye, Bye. everyone. Okay, so next up, uh, we have Bring. We have Nikolai Avrutov, VP Alliances from Bring. Bring is a delivery logistics platform for the enterprise and currently actually also for the SMB market. Pretty sure many of the people online know who Bring is. Uh, so Nikolai, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, Very good. Very good to be here, good. Daphna. Thank you. <laughs> so the floor is yours. <laughs> many thanks. Let me share my screen and let's dive in. So thank you for hosting us here. Uh, very excited to represent Bring uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar. Uh, my name is, uh, is Nico. I run the alliances team at Bring, our partnerships. And uh, um, Bring has been around since 2013. Uh, we are serving customers uh, in, uh, in Europe, North America, and Latin America, uh, including some of, uh, uh, of the biggest brands out there. And we operate across uh, fast food, restaurants, groceries, retail, healthcare, uh, logistics, and field service verticals, uh, with presence in Tel Aviv, London, uh, Toronto, Chicago, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. The, the main uh, aspect of what Bring actually does for its customers is, is, uh, is orchestration. And when we say last mile orchestration, we're really talking about real-time awareness uh, on who the customers are, uh, what are their orders, and how the inventory that is part of these orders needs to be fulfilled uh, and maintained throughout the transportation period, where this inventory is located, whether it's a warehouse or uh, a nearby uh, retail branch. And last but not the least is, who should be uh, making the delivery. And we are helping our customers to fulfill leveraging a combination of internal and external drivers. And really by connecting to customer systems, uh, whether it's the ERPs, the CRMs, the warehouse management systems, et cetera, uh, when we bring all of this data, it really becomes uh, a data game uh, for us. And that data game, that intelligence game is what we refer to as orchestration. We augment our technology with uh, a pretty robust delivery network. The carriers that are part of our network are capable of transporting anything from uh, a tractor trailer uh, to a refrigerator uh, to a sandwich from a restaurant or a package of medicine. And that network has been proven itself as quite valuable for our customers. Uh, we enable them to really transform and digitize the last mile and how it's executed uh, and the delivery network and the opportunity to tap 
tap into these capabilities in an integrated manner in a way that the business logic uh, is in place to manage that network and augment it with an external fleet, uh, with an internal fleet as well, uh, and provide the end consumer with the same experience, the same uniform experience, regardless of who the driver is, regardless if you are located in, an ur in a rural part of, uh, of the United States uh, or in a densely populated urban area uh, in, in Europe, uh, the experience is similar, and that's what we enable our customers to achieve by combining the technology and the delivery network. Um, and I would say that um, many of our customers experience our predominantly back-end intelligence and capabilities uh, expressed in their own various systems where the users actually reside. Uh, but when they don't, they have the opportunity to leverage our uh, our own front-facing uh, front-end applications, whether it's a control tower for the dispatchers and the store managers, uh, whether it's the driver app for the drivers out there, uh, and all the way to consumer uh, experience, being able to interact and monitor the arrival of the driver. Uh, and that experience has been quite critical uh, in the COVID uh, months and all the way to business insights for the leadership team. And really, I was asked to talk about uh, what we have seen and how we have experienced and how our customers, more importantly, experienced uh, the pandemic and what we saw out there. Um, and really, uh, it's been it's been such an such an, such an interesting journey uh, in which the one the three common denominators across our customers is uh, the realization that they need to be able to do more with less uh, less employees available uh, some of their workforce is out of commission or reduced and uh, no longer there uh, to fulfill on the orders uh, at the same time uh, for for the relevant verticals uh, the volume spiked dramatically uh, literally overnight and all of a sudden you need to be able to respond to that very elastically in a very short period of time uh, to manage that delivery capacity and we, when our customers think about it it's both the ability to instantaneously respond to a 500 percentage growth uh, in the in the needed capacity uh, in one period of time uh, and then to scale down uh, when less necessary and last but not the least uh, is safety how do you provide your drivers, your store uh, employees, uh, your consumers with a safe environment to materialize the fulfillment process on one hand, and how do you document this, these procedures? How do you communicate these procedures uh, to all the personas, to all the people that are th through which the inventory is changing hands, all the way to how do you deliver it while maintaining a safe distance? How do you communicate uh, that a package has arrived without putting uh, the, that, that item actually in the consumer's hands. Uh, and that's where a lot of the different capabilities that our modular system is really making available was a great opportunity for our customers to leverage uh, at, at on a completely new level, uh, whether it's dispatch automation, so there's less manual uh, processes all throughout, uh, the criticality of just-in-time order preparation. Uh, it used to be super critical for uh, for a fast food uh, a chain delivering French fries, which apparently have a seven-minute shelf life, so you really want to pull it out uh, and hand to a driver when the driver arrives and not 20 minutes before. but that just-in-time order prep became so much more critical when you all of a sudden realize that there's no food traffic into your store and you need to not only deliver to customers' homes, but you also need to uh, materialize uh, buy online pickup uh, in-store capabilities or curbside pickup. Uh, so these are capabilities that were uh, extremely important to be able to do more with less. On the delivery capacity, it goes without saying that being able to uh, deploy an app that is easy to be uh, adopted by volunteer workers in some of the initiatives where we ran uh, for uh, elderly populations or populations at risk where volunteers of all sorts come on board and, and start handling deliveries. How do you make sure that they get all the needed information and they onboard quickly and rapidly? But at the same time, how do you augment that internal uh, fleet of yours with third party deliveries? And how do you uh, you know, no, no single carrier is able to cater to a nationwide uh, demand. So how do you make sure that you provide the same experience both to those drivers as well as to the consumers wherever they are? And how do you make sure that your routes are as optimal as possible uh, as to be able to execute fast? And finally, on the safety side, there was a lot of focus on 
um, how to enable contactless delivery and how do you do it in a way that is documented, uh, communicated in real time uh, by the driver to the driver and to the consumer? Uh, how do you capture the needed information and how do you maintain the stability of your chain of custody process where uh, you all of a sudden avoid uh, encountering the consumer uh, who receives that final parcel or that package or that food delivery or that medicine face to face? So one of our responses, and Bring is predominantly an enterprise-facing uh, uh, company, uh, one of the things that we did very early on is to release a scaled down or the bare basics of what's needed to start delivering capabilities to SMB market. And that was Bring Now. It's an initiative that we've been brewing internally for a while, and we're planning to release it later on this year, uh, but the pandemic really sped things up, and Bring Now is a completely free offering uh, that allows to start delivering in a matter of hours, uh, leveraging internal fleets with the driver app, uh, as well as leveraging a couple of external uh, delivery uh, care providers that are integrated into the system uh, and that was quite uh, quite beneficial not only for SMBs but also for various uh, volunteer initiatives uh, in Israel in the United Kingdom uh, as well as uh, across the United States where um, sometimes completely completely new out of nowhere uh, formations of groups of people that just wanted to help, that just wanted to do the right thing for their community. Uh, this was a very powerful tool that really materialized this. Uh, and uh, as a, for an organization as a whole, and for me personally, that, uh, that, that gave us a lot of sense of pride of actually being able to help not only our enterprise, commercial customers, but also the community as a whole. But uh, for, for the main line of business, um, it really sped up and, and, and made very visible uh, the capabilities that are less obvious. Um, everybody know we can deliver in the last mile and everybody know we can do it effectively. Uh, but there are so many new capabilities that, uh, that are top of mind for customers. So curbside pickup, uh, it's one thing if you have three, four customers that are coming in uh, or standing by your door and expecting a delivery, but how do you operate an effective curbside pickup at scale? How do you service hundreds or thousands of customers in your location without creating a traffic jam, without having too many people having to walk around and encountering each other and coming close to one another? How do you manage a curbside pickup operation in a way that is clear, easy to understand, not only to the consumer, but also to your store employees of whom you are responsible for their safety? Uh, the other one is touchless delivery. So that entire process of communicating in real time to the consumer uh, where the driver is and how soon that driver is going to arrive in real time with map view visibility. And then leaving the package at the front door, taking a picture of it uh, and communicating it to the customer through the correct channel, whether it's an SMS, an email, uh, or any of the other omni-channel capabilities, uh, how do you communicate in a way that is documented, that is real time, uh, that is relevant and not an afterthought uh, and really build it as part of your uh, chain of custody process. And really what we're seeing uh, through the pandemic is a dramatic acceleration of trends that we have been uh, exploring for, uh, or monitoring in the market for quite a while. Um, an interesting figure, I hope I'm not confusing the numbers too much, but if I'm not mistaken, last week, uh, a quarter of grocery purchases in the US uh, were done online. Half of these purchases, uh, half of the people made in, who made these purchases did it for the first time. And with that in mind, uh, the velocity of these online uh, purchasing behaviors really speeding up uh, a few new, completely new fulfillment models that we have seen in the market and we have been supporting in the market for, for a while, but the, the adoption is just so much dramatically faster. Uh, customer priorita prioritization, how some, some of our customers have decided to prioritize uh, grocery delivery for uh, elderly uh, customers, for example. So when you are facing a two, three, uh, four week, depending on which country you are, uh, wait time for your grocery delivery, prioritizing the right populations, not necessarily uh, driven by commercial uh, uh, considerations, uh, is so, so, so top of mind. Uh, drive through or um, for curbside pickup is another trend, uh, but also realizing that so many retail, so much retail space 
uh, is losing its relevancy with negligible foot traffic coming in, how do you make sure that you leverage this real estate uh, in the most produ productive manner? So the notion of dark stores, dark kitchens, uh, micro fulfillment centers, converting your real estate to any one of these uh, really calls for a whole new way of how you execute your last mile fulfillment. Uh, how do you realize what will be more effective to deliver from your nearby fulfillment center or from the nearby uh, micro fulfillment center, which, which used to be your store? Uh, and of course, the multi-fleet management, uh, as I articulated before. We are looking at all of these trends that really picked up and escalated in their adoption dramatically over the last few months, uh, but we expect them to remain perennial. Uh, we expect these to become part of the new norm, um, which is also the title of, of our bi-weekly digital series on that topic. Uh, and we're really seeing these trends um, gaining significant ground uh, and are here to stay, uh, which really calls for uh, further transformation uh, of the last mile fulfillment of our customers. And those who, all, who already had the chance to onboard uh, and those who had a chance to leverage some of the rapid deployment capabilities during the pandemic were able to respond much more effectively and secure uh, their revenue in such a, such, a, such a much more effective way uh, during this unprecedented time. So I think this uh, rounds up the, the 10 minutes that were allocated to me. I hope I'm on time. Uh, back to you and happy to uh, take questions. Thank you, Nikolai. That was really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, your launch of Ring Now was really, to me, it was fantastic, like how fast you did that. Uh, that's a very fast pivot and it looks like it helped a lot of small businesses to stay alive. So that's, that's really impressive. Um, I have one question actually on that, like how do you think continue working with Ring Now or when people go back to the kind of the normal, they'll just go back to the old habits. How do you see this? So Bring Now is there to stay, uh, but Bring Now is far from the full blown capabilities uh, that we have to offer. Um, you know, when we say orchestration, we're talking about uh, automation, about optimization, about the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, in, in enabling much more effective fulfillment processes. So these advanced capabilities are not necessarily out there and not part of Bring Now. Uh, and for this, you need to go uh, to our broader offering. Um, we are uh, exploring various ways of putting a middle uh, offer between the free Bring Now and the full-blown Bring Enterprise, uh, but Bring Now is there to stay. It's available, it's free, and it will remain so uh, for the long term. That's good to hear. Uh, and we actually, about the AI and ML capabilities that you mentioned, there's a question here. If you can elaborate a bit more about your AI and ML capabilities, and I would also add to that maybe a question about the data running on the platform uh, who does it belong to? I think it goes kind of together. Uh, that's a great question. So uh, if you speak to our CTO um, and when we explore the realities of why do we exist, uh, the competition that our customers are facing, uh, the marketplaces out there, uh, really built a bespoke technology and set up really large fleets. Uh, to enable fulfillment, but at the end of the day, it serves their interests as an organization. Uh, what we have been positioning ourselves as is the Android uh, of, uh, of last mile fulfillment. So the, the, the whole intention is to enable our customers to uh, preserve their margin so they don't have to pay out to the marketplaces, to maintain control uh, of the process. And, and a, a critical part of this is retaining your customer data, uh, retaining your direct relationship with the customer. So we really are the back end technology that powers our consumer, our customers' operations, uh, but the data absolutely remains theirs. Uh, we are completely agnostic, both in terms of the carriers that our customers are leveraging, the business logic that they choose to implement and the models that they deploy. Uh, so to your question, Daphna, the data remains our customers. Okay, that's, that's good. One more uh, question here. So do you see any impediments to data sharing for achieving intelligent orchestration of an entire supply chain? So, I think the question is, that's a, that's a very deep philosophical question for, so thank you for asking this. I think uh, as an organization, as a company that manages 
uh, last middle and, and first, last and middle miles uh, and, and, and eventually selling uh, products uh, to customers, you want to have as much visibility throughout the entire chain as possible. Uh, you know, for so many of our customers, uh, we're starting as last mile, but the more we can see into the middle mile, uh, the more accurate and the more precise the last mile execution can be, whatever that model is. So I think if you're sharing that data, across technologies or partners that are part of your journey uh, as a company, as an organization, uh, it's great. But if you are partnering um, to, to shortcut your way into those capabilities uh, with, 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 uh, with companies or technologies that take your da data away, uh, that take your consumer data away and take your control away from the process, and this is my, uh, this is my colleague here joining me in, uh, part of the reality of working from home. Uh, Probably the best pitch I've ever seen. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, you really want to make sure that you're sharing the data in a way that is productive to you. Uh, and it starts with having the right tools and the right capabilities for you as a company uh, to manage these processes. And the more control you retain uh, over the transactioning process with your consumers and over the entire chain uh, of, uh, of distribution, the more powerful you are and the more independent you are uh, as a retailer, as a, as a brand, as a company. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nikolai, and thank you for your uh, fantastic colleague there. Uh, so it was great having you with us. Um, thank you again. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. So uh, next up, we have Fabric. We have Bobby Clay, VP Business Development from Fabric. And Fabric builds automated micro-fulfillment centers and on-demand logistics centers for retail customers. So uh, Bobby, are you here? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, but I can't see you. Oh, okay. yes. I'm trying to share my, I'm trying to turn on my video and it won't allow me to do that, interestingly. Um, what does it say? It says the host. Okay, now it says I can start it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good, so how are you, Bobby? I am very well, how are you? Good, good, thank you for joining us. So uh, again, take it away from here. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen as well as hear me. Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm responsible for business development at Fabric. So I'm, I'm, I'm working very hard on developing you know, strategic relationships that help us drive a scale and top line revenue in the business. Um, we are uh, an Israeli startup. Um, we, um, we got started about, about five years ago. Um, we, we've had some interesting things happen just in the last six or eight months. So we, um, first thing is, uh, we changed the name of our company back in October. We used to be known as Common Sense Robotics, uh, and we obviously changed the name to Fabric, and you might ask why. Um, the, the number one reason is we're a software company, right? And so it's, it's tough to be known as a software company with robots in your name. So uh, the robots are really cool, uh, but the real magic is in the software. And so since about October, we've been known, we've been known as Fabric. Um, we also, uh, in the fall of last year, we finished, we, we did a series B round of funding. We raised a little over 110 million, uh, and the clear, uh, direction from our venture capitalists was you guys are doing some great things in Israel, but you've got to get focused on the United States market. So we, uh, we moved headquarters to New York city. And so our commercial operation is based in the U S our development organization remains in, in, in Tel Aviv and, and, and always will. And um, we just uh, really quickly, um, we got started as sort of an owner operator, right? So we, we're in this business of micro fulfillment, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but we, our first two customers are actually in Tel Aviv um, and they are the, um, the largest, uh, um, what we call a drugstore in the U.S., drugstore ret retailer uh, in, in Israel, and then the second largest grocery chain in Israel. And we, we actually uh, own and operate the micro-fulfillment centers uh, uh, for, for those two companies in Israel. So a little bit about uh, what we're all about. So what, what, what our company is really founded on is this, you know, this, um, the way we've been conditioned primarily by Amazon, right? 
as, as consumers, we have in a pretty short amount of time, you know, what, two or three years, we've, we've become conditioned to expect that we can pretty much order anything we want from the, from the convenience of our home. And oh, by the way, it should be delivered for free and we can pretty much get it same day now. Uh, that's pretty cool for all of us as consumers. That's a huge challenge for every other retailer on the planet, though, right? And so um, every, other retailer, every other retailer struggles with two things, right? How in the world can they do that uh, and it, you know, deliver same day, not much less you know, in an hour or two? And by the way, how can they make money at it? Um, and so that's what, that's what we're all about, this, this idea of making that possible and profitable. And so if, if you look, if you think about what it takes to do that, the really two, you know, if you're a retailer, uh, you know, whether you're in grocery or whether you're in, you know, consumer electronics, you know, how do you deal with this idea of on-demand e-commerce? How can I profitably allow my customers to order online and deliver it to them within, a, within an hour or two? And I would submit that there are really only two variables that matter. And that is how do you do that and where do you do it? And so on the house side, you basically have two options. Are you going to do it manually? Or are you going to automate it? And in terms of where are you going to do it? Are you going to do it with the, with the traditional, you know, retail supply chain, which is very, you know, centralized? Or are you going to do it locally? And since I only have 10 minutes, I'll cut to the chase. I'll tell you the answer is the only way you can do it is automated and local. And so in... So since the, since the solution is automated local, um, the way you uh, do it is this, term, this, this new term called micro-fulfillment, right? And so it's this idea of having small-scale automated warehouses that can actually be located at the store. The beauty of that is, um, A, you've got to be local you know, for a couple of reasons, right? You, you, uh, you got to be close to the customer. First of all, you can't get the, uh, the items to them within an hour. And secondly, if you're not close to them, the last mile cost will kill you, right? So you, 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 you've got to be local. And then of course, if you're gonna bring your costs down, you've got to automate. Uh, so this idea of micro fulfillment is this small scale, you know, automated uh, warehouse that literally can fit in the back of the store. The beauty of the, the stores for the retailers is you know, they've made the investment in that already, right? And so they're already close to the customer. So uh, if, you can, if you can have something that can fit in the back of the store, and so for instance, a micro our micro-fulfillment center, uh, it, it's very elastic. Uh, you can make it as big as you want, but you can also make it as small as you want. It can fit in as little as 4,000 square feet. So, you know, most any, and, and oh, by the way, you only need a clear ceiling height of 16 feet. So most retail stores, you know, can find that amount of space uh, in, in, the back of, in the back of their store. And the, the beauty of it is, of course, you cut down your last mile costs. Uh, you're able to deliver because you're, you know, within an hour because you're close by. And the other really, really important thing is, it allows you to do that without wrecking your in-store experience for your customers that still like to come into the store. You know, ironically, the, 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 one, the one advantage that all other retailers have over Amazon is that they have, you know, customers can come in and shop in the store. And, you know, what has happened recently in the absence of micro-fulfillment is they've got either their employees or third-party uh, people running through the store doing the shopping for the online e-commerce. And that, of course, is killing the, um, you know, the in-store experience. So micro-fulfillment addresses all, all of those issues. So what, what, what is it about fabrics micro-fulfillment uh, you know, that, that's so special? Um, the first thing is our system was designed from the ground up to be, to be used for on-demand e-commerce, meaning I order it online today and I want to be able to get it in, in an hour. Most solutions, you know, that you'll see out on the market have been around for a really long time and they're very much batch oriented and that sort of thing. Ours was, was built for on demand from the very beginning and it was built to be, uh, to fit into very, very small and challenging spaces that you would see in urban and, and suburban uh, environments. The second thing is it was built to enable uh, retailers to, uh, to actually be profitable at this game 
By the way, virtually every retailer out there that's doing online e-commerce today is literally losing, losing money on, on every transaction. Uh, you know, some really good research that's out uh, from the Jeffries group that talks about how uh, grocers, you know, are losing somewhere between five and $15 for every single e-commerce order that they do. Uh, so it's crazy. Um, so the beauty of our solution is because it's, it can fit in a small space and it's very elastic. You can, you can scale it up or down. Uh, and so it can give the customer profitable unit economics really at any size, you know, whether they only need to do maybe a hundred orders a day or, or whether they need to do a thousand orders a day. Uh, it, it, it can give them, uh, the same unit economics. And then the, the, the third real advantage of our solution is is it, is it reduces the risk for the retailers, right? If you're, if, if you're a retailer now and you're thinking, how in the world am I gonna build, you know, how am I gonna address this whole e-commerce thing? How am I gonna do it quickly? And how do I know it's gonna work? And gee, it's a huge investment. The beauty of our solution is it's very, very scalable. So they can actually, so let's say the, you know, the retailer thinks they only need a hundred, maybe a hundred orders a day. You know, for the first year or so, but maybe next year they may grow to 300 orders a day, maybe five or 600 the next year. The beauty of our solution is that they can start small, and uh, literally all, all you have to do is add additional racking and add additional robots uh, going forward uh, as 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 your as your business grows. And so uh, let's talk about COVID the COVID 19 pandemic for a minute. So. Um, it, it, the, the pandemic has had an, as you know, it's had an incredible impact on, on the whole world, but it's had a huge impact on our business. Um, just to give you an idea, um, you know, the pundits were saying that, so let's just talk about grocery for a minute, since that's the one that everyone's familiar with and it's the hot market right now. Um, uh, 60 days ago, uh, less than 4% of overall grocery spend was e-commerce. So it was a really, really small of over, over overall grocery, right? And the pundits were predicting it was gonna, uh, it was gonna take probably another four years or so for that to get from 4% to 10%. Well, in the matter of 60 days, uh, that, that estimate has just been crushed, right? Uh, you know, depending on, who, on whose numbers you see, uh, online e-commerce and grocery is, is as much as maybe even 30% of overall grocery. Now, obviously that will settle down um, as, you know, once the pandemic is over, but, you know, a lot of it is going to stay, right? People are good, you know, people are being forced to do online uh, ordering. And you know what, most, uh, I would, you know, most people are probably going to like it. And so uh, we, we believe that it's going to stay well, well above 10%. So it is actually literally pushed our business forward into the future, probably by four years. Um, so um, that's the first thing. So the second thing is, so what is it, what's happened to our two existing customers uh, in Israel? So their business went through the roof. And so uh, what we did with them, so Super Farm, as I mentioned, is, which is the largest uh, health and beauty uh, retail in, in Israel. Uh, they literally, from, from February to March, uh, their throughput in our system went up by 239%. And uh, similarly, uh, and by the way, Super Farm has been a customer of ours, a very mature customer of ours. They, they've been live for about a year and a half. Rami Levy is, is very new. They're actually the second largest grocery chain in Israel. Um, and they have only been live with us for about, gosh, about 90 days, barely. And so uh, being a new implementation, we were thrust into the, <laughs> to the COVID. And uh, they actually, as uh, it, so their uh, volume actually went up in, in, in one week, 244% uh, in March. And that is, and in both cases, both Superform and Romney Levy, that has pretty much been sustained uh, at, at that level ever, ever since the, the initial push. Um, so um, huge, you know, huge growth, uh, just sort of, sort of overnight. Uh, and we we expect you know a lot of it is going to to continue. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up and take questions, but I just want to point out to you we actually have a video on our on our at this link and on our website of what's going on at Super Farm and and, and Romney Levy, uh, as well as some other. We're a small company and we have a small marketing department, but we're pretty good at videos. Uh, so I would encourage you to go to our website and uh, 
check out some of the uh, some of the videos. And I think it's time for Q and A. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, I definitely like online shopping. I'm not going back, so I can tell yeah. you that. Uh, so uh, I'm rooting for your business, Bobby. So, uh, so one question we have here is, do you work with any other industries other than retail? Uh, are you capable of doing working with pharma companies as well? Um, I know you mentioned, you know, Super Pharma, just interested in, uh, you know, the different businesses you work with. Yeah, we do. Um, so, and, and um, Obviously, retail is our primary focus, and uh, and, and, gro and grocery is is a primary focus specifically right now, mostly because it's so hot, right? It's just the hottest part of the market. Um, and we actually designed our system for grocery just because grocery is the hardest uh, because of spoilage, right? Um, and so uh, the thinking was, if we can make it work in grocery, it'll work anywhere. So, um, so we're in grocery, we're in pretty much anything in retail. And the other thing that we've, that we've gotten into is something we never really thought about when we were designing the system. Uh, and that is sort of in, internal supply chain or replenishment, right? And so we're, that's happening for us a lot, not just in retail, but in, in manufacturing uh, and just all kinds of supply chain things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a really, really large, well-known brand uh, we'll just call it the hospitality industry that has 300 stores in Manhattan. So imagine that 300 stores on, in that small area. Okay. Very the challenge small. that they have, yeah, and the challenge that they have is they have paper products that they have to get into the store, and because it's so hard to get the hard the big trucks into Manhattan, they can only do it once a week. So they are forever running out of stuff, right? And so what we are going to do for them is we're going to give them the ability to actually replenish on a daily basis. And so uh, instead of forever running out of things, and oh, by the way, if, you, if, they, if they add more to their order for the week, they have nowhere to put it because the stores are so small, they have no storage whatsoever. So anyway, we're actually seeing probably, gosh, 40% of our business has something we never even considered, this idea of internal replenishment for manufacturing or just about any industry really. Thank you. So we're running a bit over time. I know there are a few other questions, but please just uh, reach out to me directly and I'll make sure that you get any question answered. Uh, but thank you very much, Bobby. And uh, we'll make sure to, to send you these questions so people can get the answers they're looking for. <laughs> um, so thank you again, Bobby. Thank you. Okay, it was really thank you very much. Pleasure having you here. Thank you. So last but not least, uh, we have 3D Signals with us. Uh, Jonathan Yuval, VP Sales of 3D Signals. Uh, they help manufacturers digitize their machines to become an industry 4.0 factory of the future. So, Jonathan, we just can't see you. Yeah, you need to turn on the uh, mic camera. Just one second. I'm trying to. Let me know if it works for you. You do Start. now. Try now again. Perfect. Okay, so we can okay. see you now. Everybody sees me? Yes, yes. Definitely. Perfect. Hi everybody, I'll try to be quick. Uh, and um, so we are 3D Signals, we operate out of Israel and Germany. Um, and we are uh, basically, uh, we are in a supply chain um, arena. So we are uh, basically focusing on the first stage of, uh, of uh, the supply chain, which is manufacturing. So what I'm gonna show you is uh, our solution in terms of uh, collecting data from uh, the manufacturing floors and how to use it. Um, so let's start. Uh, the next uh, video is gonna be uh, the, the reaction that we get from our customers after the first day of installation. Let me see if it works. Yeah, got the baby's first pair of glasses. Okay. Oh. Oh. already hate that. Oh. Christian. Christian. Open your eyes, buddy. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. Hi, Munchkin. <laughs> you like them? Like All right. <clears throat> so, um, so where's the challenge? The challenge in the market is that we have a lot of companies that are manufacturing very good stuff and they are uh, really good in uh, manufacturing, but the problem is that they have no, uh, there is no data to, uh, in order to be more efficient. 
and, and, and also to start the process of, uh, of uh, logistics. So the questions that we ask our customers are very simple. Are, do you know in real time, if your machines are really working, if they are working as planned, do you know where your bottlenecks are? Is, is your shifts, are your shifts um, uh, efficient as you, as you think they are? And are you optimizing your production? So these are the challenges in every industry. When we talk about industry four, which is the current buzzword, all the analysts are talking about AI, predictive maintenance, self-optimization. But in reality, when you go to the shop floor, the problem is trying to connect everything together. So there is a huge gap between what is said in the market and what is really happening. And our company and our solution is helping our customers moving this transition from what we call industry 0.4 to industry 4.0 and we do it uh, as I call it like a dive instructor. We are taking the, the action, we are teaching our customers how to do it and we are doing it with them. So some facts from the, from the market, there are millions and millions of machines worldwide, really small percent of them are actually connected to any kind of network and the reason is that you have like, hum, um, it's not homogeneous when you go to the shop floor, you have really old machines with new machines, you have different type of uh, vendors, they are all seated on the same platforms or the on same shop floors, and it's almost impossible to connect them together. So that leads to poor uh, data collection and that uh, lack of data result with uh, very low um, overall equipment efficiency. So that's, that's a problem in the market. And now when we have this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have uh, even, even worse conditions where managers have to stay at home and they have factories around the globe that some of them are really working and some of them are not. It's hard to take decisions. Um, it's very hard to keep the efficiency uh, going on. And obviously we as managers would like to have more access to our uh, assets. And that's, that's, a, that's a really, really big problem. And we see it every day from our customers and, and uh, uh, and so let me just give you a glimpse of uh, how we can help our customers. So this is a real num real figures, real graphs coming from um, one of our customers, which is in Germany. And you see the social distancing um, implication on the shop floor. Okay, so the morning shift and then they have to go back out of the factory and then the afternoon shifts go. So you see the manufacturing uh, um, behavior of the machines. And then how by keeping the right data or the right business insights, you can keep your KPIs even during crisis. And we see across the board with all our customers that when they have the right data um, using our platform, they are not only enabling themselves to keep their uh, production, but they are also enabling themselves to increase the capacity or on other hands in some areas, to protect the assets and protect and save a lot of money uh, by not wasting a lot of um, a lot of uh, resources. So this is what we do. We place a, a, a data acquisition uh, platform on the machine in a non-invasive way. Uh, we use uh, all kinds of sensors and then we compress the data, upload it to the cloud, and then within one day you start getting your live, real-time live view of the production floor, which includes um, um, the real time and the dashboards so you can have your BI ready within one day and then within a few weeks you we start uh, getting more deep insights of your production and what is happening and you can start improving your uh, performance. This is led by our customer success team that is taking mm -hmm. our customers hand by hand and teaching them how to use the system. This is how the system looks like. As you can see, it's non-invasive sensors that is placed over the machines and not connecting to the machine controller. This is making it uh, machine agnostic and it also enables us to uh, install very, very quickly. So it takes about 45 minutes to one hour to install on a machine. So within one day, we're one day or a few days, we're uh, connecting the entire factory. So reflecting back to the child, then you start getting the data. And when you get the data, you become happy because if you can measure things, you can actually improve them. And it doesn't really matter if you have the reports on your PC or your uh, mobile phone, or if you put a big screen on the shop floor so everybody can see everything. The point is that when you have 
the right data and the right insights, it's easy to improve. So just to summarize this part, it's a plug and play solution. Insights come very fast. We are machine agnostic. We can actually connect any type of machine. Um, it's very accurate. It's very secure because we don't connect to the actual production controller. So we are just sniffing the machine and it's a cloud-based software. So we get more and more value while we are generating more and more insights. Uh, looking at the same uh, solution via the ERP uh, solution. So, you know, ERP platforms are very good in a lot of things like planning, logistics, warehousing, human resource, finance and everything. But what's happening on the shop floor is like a black box for them. So we are shedding lights on that area and we are enabling ERP companies to get um, uh, real time data from the shop floor and by that helping them um, to, uh, to get more accurate and uh, improve their ETAs. So Samsung AG is a German company, basically it's a global company based in, in uh, headquarters in uh, Germany, Frankfurt, um, 18 sites around the world. Um, we are installed in five locations, over 100 machines, and we are serving everybody in the organization from the CEO all the way down to the operator. Uh, some facts from the, co from, uh, from the company. So you see on the left, an early adapter flow manager, we immediately um, adopted our system and he improved his performance immensely within uh, four months and then uh, uh, one year. So he's exceeding uh, his, his, his uh, KPIs by far now and the entire factory followed through. And now we see a huge increase in productivity even though they are uh, experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic and they're still improving the numbers. Direct savings are coming from our, one of our tools, which is optimizing the production. So you can actually go and see where you're wasting money or you're wasting resources. So you can save um, shifts, you can save human resource, you can save machine time, and also you can save electricity, sorry. Uh, we have this alert system in our, in our uh, solution that will give you alert when the machine is staying idle for too long or uh, should be uh, turned off. So you just go and save a lot of money. So especially in Europe, when you have to show that you are saving uh, your energy, um, that's improving your overall performance. Uh, some facts about us. Established in October 2015, raised $26 million to date with patents um, uh, that is about acoustics and uh, signal processing. Um, we just won the Red Herring Top 100 uh, Europe uh, uh, Award. And we are members of the Open Industry 4 Alliance. Um, we're already installed in Europe in 11 sites in Germany, and uh, one in the US, one in Turkey, one in Israel, and uh, we keep on pushing forward. We see no slowdown throughout this uh, pandemic because our solution is really, really helping our customers to get more visibility and control of their uh, assets. Um, as I said before, we are machine agnostic, so we are able to connect huge number of vendors, of machines, almost everything. Um, and that's it. I think I broke a record, right, Daphna? Sorry? I think I broke a record that being very fast, right? Because yes, that was very fast and very interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Um, actually, about the last thing you mentioned about the different types of machines, uh, someone is asking here, what happens when you have hundreds of machines within a facility? So I think you okay. kind of answered it, but... Um... Sure. Um, so when you talk about hundreds of machines, uh, we talk about different uh, subjects. So there are, when you have hundreds of machines, you have a lot, a lot of number of vendors. So we are able to connect to all of them. And there, the next question would probably be, each machine is doing something different. Um, so we are measuring basic information from the machines. So the, the, uh, I would say the, uh, the common ground would be availability, which means on off either. And from that, we are starting to collect more and more data and more insight. So we are providing this tool that will enable the, uh, let's say, 
from the CEO to the COO, uh, understand how well the production is optimized, okay? So it's not a problem for us uh, connecting uh, any, any number of machines and, and any type of machines. Perfect. Um, okay. I see the next yeah. question is what type of sensors? Yes. Okay. So we are uh, using different type of sensors. So previously it was more uh, about acoustics, but now we are um, um, using different and, and combination of sensors. So it could be acoustic, could be vibration, could be current sensors, or basically any type of sensors that will provide us the data that we need to collect. So for the customer side, it's, uh, it's a plug and play. They don't need to, uh, to um, um, let's say, be aware of which sensor we use. We, we, we choose the sensors and we, we from the customer side, it's the, it's the data or the insights that is important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Yuval. Hey, Jonathan, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So it's great having you here. And again, uh, anyone that wants to connect with Jonathan uh, can uh, talk to us directly and we'll yeah, do that. I see, I see one question about pricing. So we are using uh, um, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, operational costs uh, um, solution. So it's a monthly fee for, for the software. Um, so it is uh, between 200 to 300 euros per machine per month. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, we've come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you again, Tzvi, Nikolai, Bobby, and Jonathan for the outstanding presentations today. Um, from our experience in the last few months, after COVID-19 is over, uh, we think the corporates around the globe will probably do one of the two things. They will either go back to the old normal and pray to God something like this doesn't happen again, or they'll make strategic decisions and partnerships so they never steer into another crisis like this blindly. We, of course, invite you to do the latter. Uh, so please feel free to contact me directly to discuss how we can walk you through this process. And if you're interested in connecting with companies that are presented today, we'll also be happy to help you with that. You'll see my email just in a, in a second. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for your time today and for joining us. I hope you found this useful and interesting. We'll also be sending out an email with a recording of the session I hope you have a great day and most importantly, stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.